Carl? How this part came about was due to James Aubrey, Jim Aubrey, who was president of CBS. I was his first choice. I was 29 at the time. He said, you're it, kid. <laughs> Get out to Hollywood. The first thing he did was he sent me to Kenneth, the hairdresser, the famous hairdresser of Jacqueline Kennedy, and gave me a nice bob and kind of a, a not a perky look, but a clean look. Just tell me one thing. What is this stupid gag about your being a robot? I am a robot. Oh, I consist of low modulus polyethylene plastic and electronic components. I'm subproject AF709, which is to be integrated into Project Orion. Very absorbent. I compute. Meeting with Jack Shirtalk was he's a very charming man, very nice man, and he had that very successful uh, my favorite Martian. So then CBS gave him The Living Doll to do because he was a successful producer. Well, I got a call from Jack Shirtock asking if I'd be interested in producing and head writing the show. And they told me the premise because there was no pilot. It was done from a pilot script which after I got the job, I did some rewriting on, uh, but it wasn't created by me. And uh, I said, I like this show, would like to do it. I had never met Julie, and I was looking forward to that because I knew of her. And I'll never forget when I did meet her, I came to the studio for the first day and I said, I'd like to meet Miss Newmar. I said, oh, well, she happens to be on the lot and wardrobe if you'd care to go over there and meet her? I said, sure. So I went over to wardrobe and I waited and the wardrobe lady said, she'll be out in a minute. So I sat there looking at a magazine and a few minutes later out comes this apparition in a brown panties, barefooted, <laughs> and she was breathtaking. And I felt right then she was very nice. There are many innovations in my design details. I can see that. <laughs> my construction is similar to one-piece die casting, but I was hand-molded. Yeah, it's sensational work if you can get it. <laughs> I don't remember when Bob Cummings was hired. I know that they wanted um, Ephraim Zimbalist Jr. And that didn't work out, so Bob Cummings was under contract to CBS. Cummings was really toward the end of his career at that time. He'd had several series on the air successful, and he was very good. He was a very good actor, but his character wasn't the type we needed to play opposite Julie. We needed a young, younger, horny bachelor so there'd be some sexual tension between the robot and the character that uh, Bob played. It was originally called The Living Doll. Bob Cummings changed it to My Living Doll. He really wanted his living doll, but mm, I think he wanted the part, actually. <laughs> I didn't think he ever thought he was miscast. I thought that was his image of himself, and I think he tried to make the show more in his image and the relationship, but it was Julie's show, it wasn't his show, and it was my living doll, it wasn't my living doll's keeper, and uh, I think we had to play to that because that, he had the part, you know, what are you going to do? The story is one of the most brilliant stories of all time because it's the ideal woman against the man who's trying to make her perfect. <laughs> you know the situation? <laughs> it doesn't work. 
And the fact that it doesn't work is, is what gives it such wonderful laughs and comedy. I mean, the, the irritation, you know. So you need great writing and great casting. Say, we've got to get you some clothes. That, that sheet's got to go. Very well. <laughs> Not now. <laughs> Not now. I didn't mean that um, uh, literally. That doesn't compute. Wait a minute. Listen, you present a fantastic hypothesis. If, if a robot such as yourself could be given feeling, human emotions, you'd be the perfect woman. One who does as she's told, reacts the way you want her to react, and keeps her mouth shut. <laughs> No offense, of course. <laughs> the word offense doesn't compute. Excellent. We're, we're off to a good start. <laughs> Julie had a tough job. It's very easy to uh, stand there and act like a robot with no expression. Anybody can do that. But Julie brought a quality to the robot that was wonderful. She had an innate twinkle and sense of humor that came through that make the character more dimensional rather than just a flat robot. And I think what she did was the guide to later uh, movies that came out about robots. Remember Blade Runner? Uh, a robot that looked like a beautiful woman with Harrison Ford that is playing opposite her. Uh, but Julie was ahead of all that and she did a great job. She made, strange thing to say, she made the robot human. The part of the doll, the living doll, was the most difficult part of my entire career. Because how do you be someone without emotion? Yes, you can stand stock still, but you still have to make it interesting. You have to look inside and say, what's going on in there? Now, here's a person who's born like two weeks ago, just arrived on Earth. And all these things are happening around her, and she's watching, she's listening, she wants to please everybody. Uh, she does everything she's told. Well, not quite, that's where the comedy comes in. She is the ideal woman. Sorta. Stand up. Now, you see that little beauty mark? Yes, I see it. Watch. What's she doing now? I pressed its off button. <laughs> its off button? What kind of an idiot? Look, you see those other three beauty marks on the other side? That little round one reactivates her motion. Go ahead, push it. That's the most amazing... Try another button. <laughs> Go ahead, try another one. The buttons on her back, one was for speech, one was to turn off her energy. If you pushed a button, she'd <laughs> fall on the floor. Of course, if you shut, you could shut out... If you covered her eyes, that would make her not function, she'd go to sleep. She could um, do those dumb things in the 60s, like press his pants and make dinner, clean the house, file the, the papers, do all those things. But see, that didn't matter because women were doing that then, but still, all in all, you know, they were indispensable. If you didn't believe that she was a robot, all the rest of it would fall apart. It wouldn't make sense. All the talent in the world couldn't have kept the boat afloat, so to speak. She had to be that sort of center of wonderment and innocence. And, and then all of a sudden, that stuff happened. If I don't cut your switch, you can very easily win this contest and be on your way to Europe for the Miss World Shindig. 
be on my way to Europe for the Miss Shindig contest. Don't argue with me. When I... I don't argue with a robot, I turn her off. <laughs> In those days, it was different. For example, the premise of the show is a supposedly a swinging bachelor who gets a gorgeous robot living with him, and the first thing he does is get his sister to chaperone him. Well, on the face of it, that's ludicrous. But that's what you, <laughs> that's what you had to do in those days. You know, people had to sleep in separate beds and things like that in movies. So you had to be careful what you did with sexual connotations. And that's where we had to handle it, according to censorship. And uh, it didn't hurt the show. The reason these shows are wonderful is that you can go back in time and see this so-called repression. But it wasn't repression. It was just the way things were. We were properly behaved. And it, it's even more funny now to see how things have loosened up that the robot had to have a chaperone, hello, in the guise of uh, Bob Cummings' sister, or the doctor's sister, in the same apartment. Funny. It's funny today. Sis, I need a chaperone. Chaperone? Yeah. You? And I know that sounds strange. Uh, yes, yes, it does sound a little strange. Look. Now there's a switch. What am I supposed to do? Meet them at the door and fight them off with a whip and a chair? Uh, hello. Hello. <laughs> Well, now, there's something really new in slipcovers. I loved Doris Dowling. She was elegant. She was refined. She was a lady. She was uh, what was good from the 60s, the 50s, the 60s quality. She was always well-dressed, and, and she, she gave the show substance. She gave it the champagne that it wanted. I amazingly guest starred in an episode called the love machine, which was not me. I was just in it. I was so excited to be in a show with Julie because she was the goddess of my school, and then I could tell people, guess who I worked with, you know? I don't think I worked exactly with her very much in that particular show, but she was there. And then Mr. Cummings, who was a wonderful actor and a... And a a great movie star. The basic premise was that uh, the character Jack Mullaney played was having a hard time getting a date. And so uh, they fix me up with him. Hi. <laughs> I think I'd like to... I'll order for you, my dear. Waiter? Yes, sir. Oh. Two oysters on the half shell, lobster thermidor for two, and a bottle of some amusing wine. Are you quite through? Sure. Why? I hate fish. Oysters give me blotches. Blotches? I have to wash my hands. <laughs> I had the good fortune of auditioning the five different actors who were to play the second role of Peter Robinson, the one played by Jack Mullaney. And it was Dick Van Dyke's brother, Jerry Van Dyke auditioned. There were a lot of good people. But Jack Mullaney was absolutely the best. He just had a charm, an ingratiating kind of being there totally with you that made uh, the whole production just wonderful for me to be a part of. So I was quite rooting for Jack Mullaney. It was a wonderful second banana because... The character he played was Jack. He had this unusual approach. That's the way he was in real life. He was kind of off-center and funny and charming. And that's the character he played. And you needed something to be totally opposite to Bob Cummings. You learn comedy from people around you. 
people who teach you things. Uh, you pick it up, they help you. And then if you have a good inner sense, a kind of a musical sense of, I know in my scripts I have beats between words. I'll put a number five because I know there's five beats there that you have to wait <clears throat> for the audience to kind of, oh, and then they laugh, you know. It's all, to me, it's all about music. Comedy is. She was the title character, the doll, and uh, certainly novel and, and amazing to watch, you know, gorgeous and funny. I mean, to be robotic and really be funny at the same time is pretty good. Uh I hope you two didn't have anything planned. Dr. McDonald was just about to deactivate me. Deactivate you? How does he do that? By either shutting out my light source or by pressing one of my beauty marks. My, it must be difficult for doctors to keep up with all the new scientific achievements. I studied with Etienne Ducroux, great mime teacher, Marcel Marceau teacher. Uh, mime was a complete natural thing for me to do as a dancer. But then I had been cho choreographer at uh, Universal Studios. I'd studied every form of dance there was, so I knew all the movements. It was just totally natural for me to physicalize this creature. I'll probably hit the panic button. <laughs> Was Billig in the slithy toes, the gyrant gimbal in the wave, no. or Mimsy with the bar goes in the morning grass outside? Now stop that! <laughs> a dancer can do anything. Didn't you know that? Yeah, you can do anything with your body. That's that's what so helps helps the comedy so much. Just put the idea in the brain, and and the body follows through. I think the best acting I could do would be without dialogue. I don't need dialogue. Just ideas, thoughts, and the body tells the story. And to a good extent, that's, that was the living doll. I was trained at the actor's studio, and that has an effect on you. It, it imposes a naturalness and um, Mm, although that changes over the decades, the vocal pattern had to be worked out because you didn't want to imitate anyone else being an automatic functioning person. You just had to invent it. So maybe the breathing would come in the middle of a sentence or before an important word, see, because you ran out of Or you had to accentuate something that had to be funny in the next instance, see? So you, it's like setting up a joke. You're the straight person for, for the comedian. If I can program you so that you can duplicate human emotions, and then those emotions can be controlled in, in such... That doesn't compute. No. No, and if it ever does, we'll have created a new breed of woman. Predictable. <laughs> so until I can get time to program you properly so that, uh, well, you'll understand all this and be able to function more or less normally around the house, I'm sorry. But I've got to see to it that you stay right here in this room. I'll do whatever I'm instructed to do. It actually took me until the 13th episode of playing Rhoda that I really felt as if all my sensory system worked, as if what I was doing didn't just come from my head. It came from the body, which was moving like a robot, and but not stiff. You have to move from the inside out. It was very difficult. The first person who came to talk to me the day on the set was the director, who was a very famous radio actor, 
Ezra Stone. He was fretting, and he was... He needed someone to talk to. I guess everybody else, maybe they were too close to the show or heard enough of him already, but he started talking to me about all his grief and about his not knowing what the script would be because it seems that, um, at least this is what Ezra Stone told me, he said that Mr. Cummings would take the script home with him over the weekend and, and rewrite the script. So he never knew what he was going to direct. And it made him a little crazy, I think. There was one day I came in and uh, he had written me out of the script. <laughs> mm, but I got back in. I knew that Julie was having her troubles on this set with Cummings, telling her how to act and suggesting this and that. And, uh, but... That's the way he was. Julie handled it just right. Because, uh, to repeat myself, it was her show, not his. Bob Cummings and I got along winningly. We never had any cross words. I think it's that professionalism that allows you to always look for the other person's best. Uh, it was a surprise to me that he left. Th nobody told me the inside stuff. You hear a lot of stories, but um, I'll let someone else tell those stories, because I really wasn't privy to them. I never really knew whether he was fired or mutually agreed to be off the show. Uh, it was just a fact that was given to me, and that I had to think of something creative to uh, make up the transition. So we went to Jack uh, Mulaney, who lived down the hall already and had the hots for the robot and did a few episodes about that. But he wasn't the right guy for that either. But it was handy for the moment to be able to make the transition. So we did that. And at that point, without really recasting it properly, we felt that uh, it wasn't going to go any further, the show, which is regrettable because it deserved another year. And I think with the right guy, it could have gone a few more years. My favorite episodes were Something Borrowed, Something Blue. Uh, another one was I'll Leave It to You, then Pool Shark, and The Witness. Would you tell the judge, in your own words, what you saw when the accident took place? I saw three letters, an electric shaver, and a bottle of Gur, the aftershave for men, in the dispatch case on my lap. I also had peripheral vision of the windshield, the dashboard, including the speedometer, which read 3,847 and two-tenths miles. One minute. How could you see what happened at the rear of the car if you were looking down at a dispatch case in your lap? The laws of physics rule out the normal bending of light rays. Therefore, I could not see a crash at the back of my back if I was looking downward. Oh, but she told me that I... She just, she just told me a moment now. Go well, quiet, everybody. I'll handle this. Now, relax. My Living Dog was a single camera show. There was no audience. It, it was like a movie. And um, when you finally see it on television all put together, it was really interesting because you only knew your parts when you were doing it. And also you heard an audience that, of course, wasn't there. The, the canned laughter was always interesting. You think, oh, I didn't know that was funny, you know. <laughs> we overlooked black and white. Black and white film made people look glorious. I guess they had to tend to the lighting more so that, the, you know, you saw the shapes of the face and you think of Marlene Dietrich and you think of the thin man and you think of uh, Greta Garbo and you think of... When I look at these shows again, I think, wow, maybe I was never more beautiful. Maybe that's the way to be, to have a story more, better told. Maybe there's more intention, intensity with black and white. Half hour sitcoms have always been popular. Living Doll was light years ahead of the subject matter because they were. No one was really thinking in terms of beautiful robots except Rod Serling and Twilight Zone. 
at that time, where they had one, you might recall. They sent a guy to some planet, and for companionship, they sent a beautiful robot, which he fell in love with. It wasn't like it is now. You know, everything's robot now. If that show were to be done now, it would have a much more receptive audience immediately. But it was good while it lasted. I really enjoyed it. It was fun. Good bunch of people. Ah, oh, I'm not a feminist. I'm too feminine. Um, I think I'm more envied than having to fight for something I've already got. Um, I'm really very grateful. And if I came back on Earth, I'd be a woman. I'd be a little girl. But I like, I like being a female. Men are so dishy. I think a show like My Living Doll is timeless. And especially Julie's character, because she was like a fantasy real person who was not real. How can we say this? <laughs> but she, uh, it still is amusing. And, and I think and now with Mad Men, with all the 60s stuff, it just sort of fits right in on television. It is kind of a cult feature. And it should have a long life. It should be done again and again because it's the premise of the living doll is such a great story. Are you all right, Rhoda? My systems are functioning normally. <laughs> well, splendid, and you won't have to drop out. No, I'm afraid she will. She'll have to drop out now, definitely. I'm on my way to be Miss Shindig in the World Contest. <laughs> I wish Living Doll had been a giant success because I deserved it. I deserved that wonderful part. It was the challenge of my lifetime. You had to build a whole person out of nothing, maybe just some slim ideas, little bits of dialogue, uh, circumstances, uh, conditions. Difficult. I like the Difficulty. All problems are computable. What a goofy robot. The goofiest. 